<clears throat> um, give the panel that's judging you an opportunity to introduce themselves to you. Um, it always helps me uh, when presenting to a jury to know who I'm talking to. And so I'll uh, refer to uh, Tillis first and then Friedel and then Heiner Slattery in that order and just tell us a bit about you and what you do. Uh, <clears throat> Terry Tillis, I now work as a principal law clerk to a family court judge in Suffolk County, New York. And since March 17th, all we have done is virtual court appearances and trials. Jay Ferdell here. I'm about to be a 3L at UCLA Law School, and I've achieved mock trial success nationally at both the law school and the college level. Kate Hainer Slattery here. Um, I competed in mock trial through high school and college. I now coach a couple college teams. All right, with that, everyone's here and we have received the green light to get started. So we'll call the case of United States versus Kara Bassett. My name is Judge Eslick. Uh, scoring judges, and this applies to jurors, please look to the two buttons on the lower left of your screen and turn off your audio and video. And these should remain off until the trial ends. There is an exception if you have trouble hearing a witness or hearing an attorney, please break in because I wanna make sure that you hear everything that's being said today. And then also you should have your video set to hide non-video participants. And that means the only people on the screen right now should be the advocates and me. And I will change my video that way. So Ms. Heiner Slattery, can you fix yours? Is mine showing video? I have it marked as not. Okay, it's showing up on mine. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and get started and hopefully this will work itself out. So can I have appearances first on behalf of the government? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. My name is Theodora Chobano and I am representing the government in today's case along with my second chair, Catherine Yu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And then appearances on behalf of the defendant. If you're speaking, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now, Your Honor? Yep. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Meredith Fenyo, and today I represent Kara Bassett. I'm joined by my co-counsel, Maya Julian Kwong. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Um, are there any preliminary matters on behalf of the government? Yes, Your Honor. First, we would like to take judicial notice of Judge Falkenstein uh, ruling number seven, which states that exhibits four through 33 are pre-admitted and may be used at any time for any purpose. So noted. Furthermore, we would like to take note of stipulation 12, which states that on August 18th, 2018, Leon County and the state of Florida declared Don Clark deceased. Okay, so noted. At this time, Your Honor, the government is ready to proceed. On behalf of the defendant, any preliminary matters? Just two, Your Honor. Uh, first, we'd like to invoke Rule 615, which states that all witnesses are constructively sequestered. Any objection from the government? No objection, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, granted, second. Yes, Your Honor, we'd just like to ask the court to constructively uh, swear in all the witnesses prior to them testifying today, pursuant to Rule 603. That's fine with me. Uh, no one will have to take the oath as our bailiff is virtual and I don't think there's a Bible around. Um, any other preliminary matters on behalf of the defendant? No, Your Honor, with that, the defense is ready to proceed. Okay, we're now going to do opening statements. So each party should make sure they are in speak, everyone viewing rather, should make sure they are in speaker view, which is in the upper right corner of your screen. And then attorneys and second chairs, please remember to make sure to mute your audio when the other party is speaking. Um, I'll add to this that anyone watching should make sure that their audio is muted. In the last round, we had someone uh, take a phone call uh, in the middle of the round, and that's distracting for everyone. 
So with that, we will hear from the government. Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. Nothing mattered more to Kara Bassett, the elephant. Nothing. It's August 18th, 2017, and Kara Bassett sits in the home that she shares with her husband, Don Clark. She sits and she thinks about the six years of broken promises, about the six years where Don swore that he would transform the park a sanctuary. She sits and she gets her priorities straight. Nothing matters more to her than the elephants. She picks up a syringe of carfentanil, a deadly elephant tranquilizer. She plunges it into her husband's body. She drives him to the big gum swamp, 13,000 acre swamp, and leaves him there. She drives his van to the airport and she puts her plan into motion. For a week, she doesn't call the police. She doesn't call or text Don Clark. And on October 1st, 2017, Kara invokes power of attorney. She shows the world that nothing matters more to her, the elephants. She takes control of the elephant park and transforms it to a sanctuary, to what she's always wanted. Today, the government holds the burden of proof. That means we must show to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Kara Bassett killed her husband, Don Clark, with malice aforethought. This essentially means that she meant to kill Don Clark. We will show this to you beyond a reasonable doubt because to Kara Bassett, nothing is more important than the elephants. First, the government will bring to you Agent Steph Branham. Now, Mr. Branham works for the FBI. He will tell you they found the deadly substance carfentanil on the elephant park. Moreover, Kara Bassett had access to this carfentanil. There was a syringe missing. Agent Branham will also tell you about mud containing algae samples on the driver's side pedal of Don's car, a car in motion on the night of Don's disappearance. That these algae samples match samples from the big gum swamp, samples that match mud samples found on Kara Bassett's boots. Lastly, Agent Brandon will tell you about the power of attorney clause, that Kara requested a specific disappearance clause be added. Just one month after Dawn's disappearance, she invoked power of attorney. Now, the defense will bring to you Joe Young, someone who is making a documentary about Kara and Dawn. But even Joe Young will tell you that Kara and Dawn often fought that Kara hated the way the park was run. These arguments would escalate. Tell you that Kara Bassett just wanted a sanctuary because nothing was more important to her than the elephants. Don was a businessman who wanted money. Members of the jury, you will hear the defendant's own words. You will hear her tell you she was steaming at her husband's words. She was furious that nothing mattered more to her the elephants. The end of this trial, I will stand before you again today and I will ask you to return a verdict consistent with the facts. Find Kara Bassett guilty because nothing matters more to her the elephants. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of the defendant. Yes, Your Honor. He had a plan, and she wasn't part of it. Members of the jury, this is Kara Bassett. She's kind, she's passionate, and she was once a loving wife to her husband, Don Clark. But their marriage, it didn't end the way opposing counsel it just told you she, it did. She didn't kill her husband. No, members of the jury, on August 18th, 2017, uh, Mr. Clark didn't die. He wasn't killed. 
he abandoned his wife for a new life in Costa Rica. At 11 p.m. on August 18th, Mr. Clark was standing outside of the home he shared with Kara Bass. He was preparing. He had a plan. He took out his cell phone and sent his wife a text for the last time. He then flipped that phone over, removed the SIM card, and destroyed it. He was off the grid. Uh, but Miss Bassett, she was still inside. As she was still sleeping, she thought she'd wake up with her husband still by her side. But she'd soon find out that she was wrong. And because Mr. Clark had gotten in his van, he had driven away. He was gone. Now, members of the jury, uh, today you'll learn that Mr. Clark had been preparing for this departure for some time. Uh, you'll learn that Mr. Clark had planned to buy property in Costa Rica. He had planned to transfer money into Costa Rican bank accounts, and he had planned to get off the books cash in order. You'll learn today uh, that Mr. Clark was in contact with Costa Rican businessmen who were helping him plan his departure. And when Ms. Young testifies today, you'll learn that on August 18th, Mr. Clark received a text message from a Costa Rican phone number. It said, call me immediately. And he did for 52 minutes. Five hours later, Mr. Clark was gone. No warnings, no goodbyes. He left and never looked back. He left his wife alone because he had a plan and she wasn't part of it. Now, despite that, uh, today opposing counsel has charged Ms. Bassett with the murder of Don Clark, and they have the burden of proving that to you today uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. So when they present their case to you today, I want you to ask yourself, did the FBI recover uh, Mr. Clark's body? Did the FBI recover a murder weapon? And did anyone see my client driving that van on August 18th? Because members of the jury, when you ask yourself those questions, you'll learn the prosecution, they have no body. They have no murder weapon. They have no visual evidence tying my client to the crime. They have no proof. Because Ms. Bassett didn't kill Don Clark. He abandoned her for a new life in Costa Rica. He had a plan. She wasn't part of it. That's why at the end of today's trial, I'm going to ask you to find Miss Bassett not guilty. Thank you. Thank you. Before we uh, continue with the government's case in chief, uh, please, anyone on the video, switch to gallery view. And what that will do is let the attorneys and witnesses be visible at the same time during uh, direct and cross examination. The other thing I was at, I would add is that we're, <clears throat> we're doing this virtually. And so if there are objections, um, just make sure to speak up and make sure you are unmuted. Um, in the prior round, we had a couple of objections that came a couple of questions late because someone was muted. So just make sure that, um, that you're unmuted. Um, does the government have evidence? And you're yes, muted. Your okay. All right. Got it. <laughs> Uh, you may call your witness. Your Honor, at this time, the government calls Steph Branham to the stand. You can proceed when ready. Mr. Branham, before we start, can you see and hear me okay? Yes, ma'am, I can. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Good afternoon. My name is Senior Agent Steph Branham. I'm short for Stephen. You just said Senior Agent. Where do you work? I work at the FBI in Jacksonville, uh, specifically in the Criminal Investigations Division. How are you related to today's case? I was the lead investigator into the disappearance of a man named Don Clark. As part of your investigation, what did you do? I searched Don Clark's property, uh, his home, his elephant park that he owned. I looked into Don Clark's legal affairs, and I reached a conclusion, and eventually I made an arrest. Who did you arrest? I arrested the defendant in today's case, Kara Bassett. I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning of your investigation. 
When were you first contacted about Don Clark's disappearance? That would be August 25th, one week after the initial disappearance of Don Clark on August 18th, as the result of our investigation. Who contacted you? That would be his then wife, Kara Clark. What did she claim happened? All she told us was that Don Clark disappeared. She didn't give us an explanation for the events that happened on the 18th. Did you ever investigate Don Clark's bank records? Yes, ma'am, we did. What did they show? It showed that after August 18th, other than what Kara Bassett did, having power of attorney over Don Clark, there was no account activity for Don Clark on his credit cards or any financial needs. Did you investigate Don Clark's phone records? Yes, ma'am, we did. What did they show you? They showed us that Don Clark, his phone was lost signal at 1114, and that afterwards, on August 18th, after August 18th, excuse me, Kara Bassett never called him or never texted him. I'd like to talk a little bit about the things that Don owned. Did you ever investigate his vehicles? Yes, ma'am, we did. What vehicles did you investigate? On the Elephant Park, we found a Chevrolet van. You just said Chevrolet van. If you could look at Exhibit 26. Is yes, ma'am, I see that. Sorry, is this the van that you investigated? Uh, yes, ma'am, it is. That's the condition we found it in at the airport five miles away from the Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park. Now, was there any record of where this van was on the night of August 18th, 2017? Yes, ma'am. We pulled the GPS records for the van for the night of the August 18th. What did these GPS records show? On the night of the 18th, the van traveled 139 miles due east to the Big Gum Swamp in Florida. What did it do then? After traveling to the swamp late at night, staying at the swamp for about an hour, the van traveled to an airport five miles away from the elephant. Did your investigation involve any sort of forensic analysis of the van? Yes, ma'am, it did. What did your forensic analysis yield? We found out through our forensic investigation that there was a mud algae mixture on the driver's side pedal of that van. Did you take any mud samples from the Big Gum Swamp? Yes, ma'am, we did. And in fact, what we found was that same mud algae mixture that we found on the driver's side pedal of the Chevrolet Express uh, was actually consistent most likely came from the big gum swamp. Did you find any similar samples at the Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park? Yes, ma'am, we did. We found the same type of algae mixture on a pair of boots. What is so significant about this algae mixture? It's rare to see two specific types of algae be mixed in one space. That's why our investigation concluded that this specific type of algae had to have come from the big gum swamp. Who did these boots belong to? The boots belong to the defendant, Kara Bassett. I'd like to discuss your search of the elephant park now. As part of your investigation, did you search the park? Uh, yes, ma'am, we did. Did you find anything relevant to your investigation there? Yes, ma'am. We came to find out that the defendant has carfentanil, which is an elephant tranquilizer, on the property. Is carfentanil dangerous? Yes, ma'am, highly dangerous. It's 5,000 times more toxic than heroin. Only one milligram is needed to kill an adult human. And who had access to this highly lethal substance? Some of the park staff and the defendant, Kara Bassett. Objection, lack of foundation as to how this witness would know who had access to the carfentanil syringes on the Elephant Park property. Bounce. Yes, Your Honor. The witness was just about to testify as to how he had knowledge. Additionally, as part of his investigation, he would have reviewed who had access to this dangerous substance. Then let's put the cart and horse in the correct order. Um, the objection is sustained. The answer is stricken. But you can ask your question again. Yes, Your Honor. How do you know who had access to this carfentanil? I was able to review a log of the carfentanil that was kept at the elephant park. Now, based on this log, were you able to determine who had access to the carfentanil? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kara Clark, the initial CC. Kara Clark was Kara Clark at the time, now Kara Bassett, and some of the park staff. Now, on the very last entry of this log, it says that Kara Clark was the last one to check out a syringe. At that time, there were 24 syringes. Did you locate all of them? No, ma'am. 
When the FBI conducted its investigation on August 25th, we actually found that there were only 23 syringes in the medical cabinet. One was missing and unaccounted for. After Don's disappearance, what happened to the elephant park? Kara Bassett invoked power of attorney, meaning that she was able to transform the elephant park to a sanctuary just two months after Don Clark's initial disappearance. As part of your investigation, did you ever speak to Kara Bassett about this park? Yes, ma'am, we did. We were able to interview her. What did she say? She told us that the idea of seeing elephants in cages infuriated her. She was steaming that Don Clark hadn't made good on his promise but to turn it into an elephant park. Did you ever speak to Don's lawyer as part of your investigation? Yes, ma'am, I did. Could you tell us a little bit more about the power of attorney that you mentioned earlier? Yes, ma'am. The Don Clark's attorney sent us a letter uh, essentially telling us that Kara Bassett had power of attorney over Don Clark, so she would be able to, excuse me, she would be able to make the financial choices after Don Clark had disappeared. Was there any sort of specific clause that gave Carabas at this power? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Don Clark's lawyer informed us through a letter that there was a disappearance clause in the power of attorney ag agreement I mentioned earlier. Did Ms. Tuminelli tell you whether she thought this clause was standard? Uh, yes, ma'am, she did. She detailed that in her field, she has never seen a disappearance clause, and it's very uncommon. Did Ms. Tuminelli tell you who asked for this clause? Yes, ma'am, she included that in her letter as well. She told us that Kara Bassett insisted on this disappearance clause being included. Was Don ever declared legally dead? Yes, ma'am, he was. Did you ever find out who requested Don to be declared legally dead? Yes, ma'am, we did. And we spoke to Kara Bassett in August of 2018, one year after Don Clark's disappearance, as soon as she was legally allowed to declare him dead. She told us that he was gone, and she requested that he be declared legally dead. Thank you. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross? Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? Good afternoon, Agent Brand. Good afternoon, ma'am. Now, on direct examination, you talked a little bit about the evidence you do have. I want to start by talking about the evidence you don't have, uh, beginning with that syringe of carfentanil you mentioned on direct examination. Ms. Julian Kwong, we can get Exhibit 18 pulled up, which is a pre-admitted photograph of a carfentanil syringe. Now, Agent yes, ma'am, it is. One of these syringes had gone missing from the elephant park, right? That's true, ma'am. In our investigation, we found out that there were only 23 syringes on the property when there were supposed to be 24. But you don't have this syringe with you in court today, do you? But no, ma'am, we don't. It was missing. Right, you never recovered it. That's correct, ma'am. You never recovered what you believe is a murder weapon. Yes, ma'am, that's true. And Agent, because of that, you don't know whose fingerprints were on that syringe, do you? Uh, no, ma'am, without having the carfentanil syringe, we were not able to test it for any fingerprints or any other forensic evidence. Right, now let's move on to Mr. Clark's body. You said on direct examination that Mr. Clark was declared legally deceased, right? Yes, ma'am. On August 2018, he was declared legally dead one year after his initial disappearance. Now, Agent Branham, you don't have Mr. Clark's body, do you? No, ma'am, we don't. We were never able to recover Mr. Clark's body. And because you were unable to recover Mr. Clark's body, you weren't able to conduct an autopsy, true? That's true, ma'am. So uh, you weren't able to get a toxicology report, right? Uh, no, ma'am. As you mentioned, we were not able to recover Don Clark's body, so we were not able to test it for any forensic evidence at all. And when you searched Big Gum Swamp, you didn't find Mr. Clark's keys, did you? Uh, no, ma'am. His keys, his phone, and his wallet were not able to be recovered during our investigation either. Uh, Agent, let's move on uh, to visual evidence in today's case. Now, you didn't find any camera footage from the park or airport showing my client driving Mr. Clark's van, did you? No, ma'am, we didn't. Didn't find any eyewitnesses, right? No, ma'am, unfortunately, we do not have an eyewitness to Don Clark's murder. Objection, Your Honor, speculation as to Don Clark's murder.
Is that an objection or a motion to strike? Uh, objection, Your Honor, and a motion to strike if the objection is sustained. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to overrule the objection, and you can ask a pointed follow-up question. Of course, Your Honor. Now, Agent Brandon, you didn't find any visual proof that it was my client who was driving that thing, right? No, ma'am, we did. Okay. Now, uh, let's move to the forensic evidence you mentioned on direct examination, uh, algae. Now, you said on direct that Big Gum Swamp is home to a rare combination of algae. True? Yes, ma'am, we did find that out in our investigation. Right, and you found the same combination of algae on my client's boots? That's correct, ma'am. That's what we believe ties her to the Big Gum Swamp. Okay, well, Agent, let's talk about that, because you're aware my client lived at an elephant park? Uh, yes, ma'am, I am. You're aware she worked at that elephant park? I am aware that she worked at an elephant park. Ms. Jilin Kwong, we can get exhibits 24 and 25 pulled up, which are pre-admitted photographs of the elephant park. Now, Agent Brennan, you'll agree the elephant park, it wasn't the most sanitary, was it? Uh, no, ma'am, the elephant park was not the most sanitary place. Right, there was dirt everywhere. Yes, of course, ma'am. There was water everywhere? Um, I wouldn't say everywhere, but in a portion of the park, sure. Now, Ms. Jillian Kwong, we can get Exhibit 5 pulled up. It's a pre-admitted copy of the forensic report from the FBI. Now, Agent, despite all of that, you didn't test to see if the algae from my client's boots could have come from anywhere within the algae. Yes or no? That's true, ma'am. We did not test. Now, let's move to Mr. Clark's connections. To Costa Rica. Uh, Ms. Jillian Kwong, we can get Exhibit 4 pulled up, which is a pre-admitted letter from Mr. Clark's attorney to Agent Steph Branham. Now, Agent, in this letter, you were made aware that Mr. Clark had plans to buy property in Costa Rica, right? That is true, ma'am. That was a point of this letter. Right. He had plans to transfer money into Costa Rican bank accounts. Uh, that's what it says here. I'm not sure of the truth of that, but that is what it says on the document. And Mr. Clark claimed he had off the books cash. Isn't that right? Again, that's what it says here in the letter. I'm not sure how true that is. But that's what it says in the letter? Yes, ma'am. That is what it says in the letter. And also in that letter, Mr. Clark makes it clear he doesn't want his wife to know about these plans he has. It's true? Uh, yes, ma'am. That is what it says in the letter. Again, I cannot tell you if that's true. Okay. Now, let's move to the phone calls that Mr. Clark had on August 18th. Uh, Ms. Jillian Kwong, we can get Exhibit 21 pulled up. It's a pre-admitted copy of Don Clark's phone records from August 18th. Now, Agent, you're aware that Mr. Clark had a 52-minute phone call on August 18th, right? I am aware. I do see that here. Right. It was with a Costa Rican phone number. Uh, that is true, ma'am. Okay. You don't know who Don Clark called, though, do you? Uh, no, ma'am. Based on the phone records that we pulled, all we could gather was that it was an unlisted number in Costa Rica. Is that the answer to my question? You don't know who he called? Yes, ma'am. And Agent, you also don't know what they talked about on that phone call, isn't that right? Uh, no, ma'am, the phone records don't tell us that information. Uh, but Agent, what you do know is that was the same day Don Clark disappeared. Yes or no? August 18th, that's correct, ma'am. Nothing further. Any further examination? Yes, Your Honor, brief redirect. Don't First, I'd like to discuss a point that defense counsel just made about Don Clark's cash. Did Mandy Tuminelli tell you if Don Clark ever asked her to purchase these properties in Costa Rica? Uh, yes, ma'am. The point in the letter was that, unfortunately, Don Clark disappeared before he could give the order. Whose boots match the Big Gum Swamp? The defendant's carabasa. Who requested the disappearance clause in the power of attorney form? Based on that letter, it was the defendant, Carabasa. Who had access to Carfentanil? The defendant, Carabasa. Finally, who transformed the park into a sanctuary just one month after her husband's disappearance? Once again, it was Carabasa. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Any further examination from the defendant? No recross, Your Honor. You are excused. Thank you for your time. Uh, any further evidence on behalf of the government? No, Your Honor. At this time, the government rests its case in chief. All right. Thank you very much. Before we go to the defendant's case in chief, do any of the advocates or any of the jurors need a break? We're running a bit ahead of schedule.
Hearing none, uh, we will go to the defendant and you may present your case. At this time, the defense calls Ms. Jo Young. Good afternoon, Ms. Young. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a documentarian, primarily focusing on life in the American Southeast. And how did you get into filming documentary? Uh, well, I grew up in the UK, as you can probably tell. Um, so I've really always looked up to uh, a UK documentarian by the name of Louis Theroux, who also focused on um, telling honest stories of um, American life. And do you know Kara Bassett? Yeah. Um, in 2015, a few years into my filmmaking career, um, Kara Bassett reached out to me to discuss me filming um, uh, at, at the elephant park that she ran. And do you know Don Clark, her husband? I do, yes. Uh, Don Clark was obviously married to Cara Bassett, um, and then he was also the owner of the elephant park, so they worked together as well. Now, Ms. Young, you said you filmed a documentary of Cara Bassett. Uh, what did filming this documentary look like on the day to day? Um, most days it was a nine to five. Um, I would arrive at the park, I'd film. Um, the elephants, the staff at the park, um, uh, guests, and then of course Cara Bassett and her husband Don. Now, let's move to what you observed while filming this documentary. Uh, what, if anything, did you learn about the relationship between Don Clark and Cara Bassett? Um, it generally seemed a, a positive, admiring relationship. Um, from what I saw, they cared about each other very deeply. And were you at the Allison Park on August 18th, 2017? I do, I, I was, yes. Uh, I was there from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. if I recall. Uh, generally over summer, the park is busier. Um, so there was more footage to, to collect that day. And did you see Cara Bassett at all that day? Yeah, uh, Cara was there just doing her uh, regular maintenance duties at the park. And how did Miss Bassett see? Uh, based on what I saw, Miss Bassett was behaving regularly. Um, as I said, we're quite bit the, the park is quite busy over summer, um, so Miss Bassett was just working all day. And did you see her husband, Don Clark, at all that day? I did. Um, I actually spoke to Don that day. Um, I was going on a trip to Mexico that night, so I spoke to Don a little about that. And what happened when you guys were having this conversation? Um, as I said, I was telling him about that trip I had, um, but then at some point he looked down at his phone. He looked somewhat scared. Um, Question and... on your speculation. Response? Yes, Your Honor. Pursuant to the Federal Rules of Evidence, Rule 701, this is an admissible lay witness opinion. Uh, Ms. Young is basing this opinion off of her Rapson based perception. My, my recollection of the answer is that he looked scared, is what she said, not he was scared. Yes, Your Honor. Um, do you have a response to that, Counsel? Uh, yes, Your Honor. This is still uh, not rationally based, as she is now testifying as to what Don Clark felt. He, she's saying what he looked like, so the objection is overruled. Yes, Your Honor. Did you get a chance to finish your answer, Ms. Young? Um, no. So, as I was saying, he looked down at his phone. Um, he looked somewhat scared. Uh, and then he kind of walked away mid-conversation. Now, Miss Young, do you know around what time this conversation happened at? Um, I kind of caught him as I was leaving the park, so it would have been around 6 p.m. Ms. Julian Huang, we can get Exhibit 21 pulled up. A pre-admitted copy of the phone records of Don Clark from August 18th. Now, Miss Young, looking at this exhibit, what text messages did Don Clark receive at 6 p.m.? Uh, he received two text messages um, saying, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, call me immediately. And do you know if he called that phone number? Uh, he did. He did take a call. Yeah, it actually says right there. Uh, he called that phone number immediately. And how long did that phone conversation last? Uh, over 50 minutes, 52 minutes. And where did the phone number he called uh, originate from? 
Uh, this phone number was from Costa Rica. Now, Miss Young, did you hear what they talked about on that phone call? I didn't, no. Um, as I said, when Don took this phone call, he walked away quite quickly, um, so I didn't catch what he was talking about. And after Mr. Clark rushed away, did you ever see him again? No. Um, I thought I would see him when I got back from my trip to Mexico, uh, but I didn't even get to say goodbye. He was in such a hurry when he left. Never saw him again. Now, uh, Miss Young, after Mr. Clark disappeared, how did Miss Bassett seem to be responding? She seemed sad. Um, I mean, her husband had disappeared. She reacted as I would expect. And let's shift to the FBI's investigation now. Uh, do you know when the FBI got involved in Mr. Clark's disappearance? Yes. Uh, when I returned from my trip to Mexico, the FBI was at the park. Um, I, I believe it was around a week after he disappeared. And were you able to observe parts of that FBI investigation? I was. Um, as you can imagine, uh, as a documentarian, uh, there was a, a lot to do at that time. Um, so I decided to film throughout the police investigation. And how would you describe that investigation? Um, my experience with investigative reporting is limited, but it seemed somewhat sloppy to me. Um, there were people that I, I didn't Your see. Honor, question, speculation. Response. Yes, Your Honor. Again, pursuant to the Federal Rules of Evidence, Rule 701, uh, this witness testifying that the FBI investigation seems sloppy to her is an admissible lay witness opinion. Your Honor, I believe you're muted. Sorry, I warned you against that, then I do it myself. Um, <clears throat> my statement was she's now testifying about something that she admitted she knows very little about. And so that's my question to you, counsel. May I respond to that, Your Honor? Yes. <clears throat> now, if I may make an offer of proof, if permitted to testify, Ms. Young will explain why she believes the FBI's investigation was sloppy, and she'll only reference a specific commonly known police procedures, uh, like touching evidence without gloves and handling evidence with care. Uh, because of that, Your Honor, it doesn't actually take a uh, specialized knowledge or expertise uh, for this witness to form her rashly based perception. And because of that, Your Honor, under Rule 701, this is still an admissible lay witness opinion. Any response by the government? Yes, Your Honor. Now, while one specific step of the investigation may have seemed sloppy, to call the entire FBI investigation sloppy requires expert opinion. It requires knowledge of police procedure, which is something that the witness has just admitted to not having. Therefore, I, her quantifying the investigation as sloppy is speculation. I, I don't know if it necessarily requires an expert opinion, but it requires more foundation than what has been laid to show that this witness knows enough to be able to give that lay witness opinion, right? I mean, it has to be based on irrationally based perceptions. And she just said that she doesn't know that much about police investigations. So the objection is sustained, but you can uh, lay more foundation. Your Honor, move to strike. Granted. Now, Ms. Young, what did you observe about the FBI's investigation? Well, I saw that they had some younger, younger uh, employees collecting um, some of the materials around the park. I saw them touching things um, without gloves on, and there were some staffers that I never saw interviewed. And can you give the court an example of one of the things you saw the FBI agents touching without gloves? Yeah, um, Cara had some syringes of elephant tranquilizer, which she used uh, for medical procedures on the elephants, and at one point I saw these being handled without any gloves. Now, Ms. Young, how much documentary footage would you say you have in total uh, from filming your documentary? Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, I had well over uh, 2,000 hours of footage. And did the FBI ever ask you for any of that footage? Uh, no. A lot of that footage will be seen for the first time uh, in my documentary. Thank you, Ms. Young. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Further examination. Thank you. 
before we start, Miss Young, can you see and hear me okay? I can, yes. After Don Clark disappeared, you investigated his disappearance on your own, correct? That's correct. I felt that it would be uh, appropriate to do so for my documentary. In fact, you went to his house in Costa Rica, right? I did, yes. There's a lot of foundation as Hold on. There was an objection. Can you state it again, please? Yes, Your Honor, my apologies. Uh, lack of foundation as to how this witness would know uh, that Don Clark had a home in Costa Rica and how this witness would know that the home he actually went to happened to be Don Clark's. Okay, any response from the government? Yes, Your Honor. The witness testified on direct examination that she spent a lot of time working around Don and Kara Clark. Therefore, it is rational to assume that she would have knowledge of his properties. Well, and moreover, if the witness doesn't know, she can just say that. So the objection's overruled. Yes, Your Honor. You went down to Hermosa Beach as part of your investigation, right? Yeah, that's correct. And you broke into a house? Uh, yes, I, I did break in. Now, you found Don's clothes in this house, right? Uh, yeah, the clothes, there were some clothes in the closet, and they seem to be Don's. But you found no toiletries in the house. Uh, to my recollection, no, I did not. There were no lights on? No, there weren't. In fact, there was no food in the fridge? Uh, no, I don't think there was. Miss Young, you watched this house for a week, right? Uh, I believe so, that sounds correct. And you didn't see anyone go into the house? Uh, to my recollection, no, I did not. And you didn't see anyone come out of the house? No. I'd like to take a step back and talk a little bit about Don and Kara. You said that they were loving on direct examination, right? Yeah, I think that's fair. You said that they cared for one another? Yes, they did. But Don and Kara would have arguments sometimes, is that right? Yeah, although in my experience, most relationships uh, tend to include arguments. Exactly, and Don and Kara's arguments were usually about how to run the park. Yeah, I mean, they, they worked together and they were married, so that was a difficult dynamic at times. They did fight about the park sometimes. So that's a yes to my question. Their arguments were about the park. Yes. Because Don wanted the park to be a business. Yes, that's correct. But Kara Bassett wanted the park to be a sanctuary. Yes, I, I think there's a distinction there uh, with regards to how the elephants are handled. Of course, but Miss Young, the defendant would ask you to delete footage of their arguments, correct? There was some argument that she wanted deleted. I guess she didn't want them streamed online or anything. So that's a yes. She would ask you to delete footage of their disagreements. Yes. In fact, one of these arguments happened on July or August 2017, right? Yes, that was probably an argument around that time. This argument was also about how to run the park. Yes. Carol was angry during this argument. I, I think I'm recalling the correct event, yes. And she threw a vase at Don's head, right? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, improper character evidence pursuant to the Federal Rules of Evidence, Rule 404B1. Go ahead and explain your objection. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, the act of Miss uh, Bassett throwing the vase on the particular occasion opposing counsel is talking about is using to show that Miss Bassett, Ms. Bassett acted in conformity with that action on August 18th, thus pursuant to Rule 404B1 for action-based propensity evidence that is inadmissible. If I may respond, Your Honor. Please go ahead. Your Honor, pursuant to Rule 404B2, evidence for propensity may be used to show motive. Currently, I've just made the witness elicit testimony that says that their fight is about the park. This testimony shows how angry Kara was about the park, giving her a motive. Furthermore, it is not the government's theory that she threw a vase at Don's head and killed him. This specific violent action does not go to propensity, but rather to motive. May I respond to that, Your Honor? Yes, please. Now, we agree at opposing counsel that the particular substance of the disagreement that Ms. Bassett and Mr. Clark were having uh, prior to the vase being thrown uh, does fall under 404B2 to show motive. However, the particular act of Ms. Bassett throwing the vase in and of itself does not show motive. And we do believe that opposing counsel is using that violence act to show that Ms. Bassett act in conformity therewith on August 18th. And that is inadmissible under 404B1. Okay, so if I'm understanding the defendant's point of view, 
the bite is admissible, the vase throwing is not? Yes, Your Honor, the disagreements they had prior to that vase being thrown is admissible. It can go to show motive. However, the vase throwing itself isn't. Got it. So let's talk about the vase. I mean, the government's theory is not that the decedent or, you know, maybe decedent was killed with a vase. And so how is it propensity evidence if there's not an allegation of vase death? Yes, Your Honor, though there is no allegation of death by vase, uh, there is, they are still using this to show that Ms. Bassett acted violently towards Don Clark on a particular occasion. And it is their contention that Ms. Bassett acted in a similar violent manner on another day in question. And thus, because it shows violence, it is being used as action-based propensity evidence. Yeah, final word for the government. Yes, Your Honor. As a representative of the government, I can say with certainty that this is not being used for propensity. Rather, her throwing the vice shows her level of anger at Don Clark, which directly goes to her motive, given that just one month after his death, she converted the park into a sanctuary. All right, I'm going to overrule the objection and let the jury sort it out. Yes, Your Honor. I'll ask again, just a month or two before Don Clark's death, Kara Bassett was so angry about the park that she threw a vase at his head, correct? Uh, yeah, they were having an argument and she threw an elephant vase, but it actually missed, it hit the wall. But that's a yes, she did throw a vase at him. Actually threw a vase, yes. On direct examination, you said you had 2,000 hours of footage, right? That's correct, over 2,000 hours. And now these footages were interviews of Miss Bassett, right? I had interviews with Miss Bassett, with Mr. Clark, uh, guests at the park. Miss Young, if you could please look at exhibits 36 through 38. These are interviews that you did with Miss Bassett, correct? Uh, is there any, any way for me to see those exhibits? Um, th 36 through 38 sounds correct, yeah. And these videos were taken on June 15, 2017. Yes, that sounds correct. To your knowledge, these are fair and accurate videos. To my knowledge, yes. Your Honor, at this time, the government moves to, to admit exhibits 36 through 38. Okay, and as the witness, you know what these are, right? You know what you're authenticating? I understand that uh, these are the videos I was shown prior to trial. Okay. I haven't seen the, vi the video specifically in trial, obviously. Right, and so is there any complaint about that from either of the attorneys that those witnesses haven't been shown prior to their admission? Or are they pre-admitted? Your Honor, they are not pre-admitted. However, the witness has just authenticated that these are videos that she took of the defendant, Kara Bassett. Got it, any response from the defendant? We have no objections to the admission of these videos, Your Honor. That makes my job much easier. The, uh, the exhibits are admitted. Miss Yu, if you could please pull up Exhibit 38 and play it for the jury. I will take people to their grave if I have to. I will do anything to protect these elephants. Pass it, Cara. Yeah, and that's what she said to you on June 15th, 2017, correct? She could be very passionate at times, yes. Made the great footage. So that's a yes. That is what I she told you. To their grave. Yes, yes, that was part of our interview. I'd like to talk a little bit about Miss Bassett's behavior following the disappearance of her husband. Miss Bassett remarried, correct? Yes, um, about a year later, uh, she remarried. Uh, that's how she got her last name, Bassett. You just said about a year later, but I want to be clear for the jury. This was exactly one year after Don Clark disappeared on August 18th, 2018, correct? Uh, that, that sounds about right. I wasn't at the wedding, unfortunately, but that sounds similar. Now, after Dawn's disappearance, she transformed the park into a sanctuary, right? Yeah, yeah, she did. She got rid of all the cages? She did. She made it this beautiful safari, almost. And she stopped letting people near the elephants? Yes, um, it was more a view from a far sight thing after that. She transformed it from a park into a sanctuary? That's correct, yes. Miss Yu, if you could please pull up exhibit 36 and play it for the jury. Oh, I'm steaming. This is a business, not a charity. As long as it's my money, we'll run it that way. 
That's what Don said to me. Can you believe that? We'll see how this ends. This is in fact what Kara Bassett told you on June 15th, 2017, correct? Yes, yeah, that was part of that earlier interview. Yes, at this time, no further questions, Your Honor. Further examination? Yes, Your Honor. Right. <laughs> now, Ms. Young, on cross-examination, opposing counsel talked to you a little bit about your trip to Costa Rica and how you went to Don Clark's vacation home. Uh, what did you find in that vacation home? I was just looking for any evidence that Don might be alive and living there. Um, uh, I found his clothes in his, in his closet. Um, there was a fan on. Um, there was no dust in the home, which was unusual considering this was a year after Don's disappearance. And on cross-examination, the proposing counsel also talked to a lot about the relationship between Ms. Bassett and her husband, Don Clark. Towards the end of the summer of 2017, how did their relationship seem? It seemed loving. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. People argue, um, but I, I know that they loved each other, or at least that's what I saw. Thank you, Ms. Young. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. May this Thank witness you. be seated? Any further examination? Okay, the witness is excused. Um, we are now ready for any additional evidence on behalf of the defendant. We have no additional evidence, Your Honor. At this time, the defense rests. And I assume there's no rebuttal evidence on behalf of the government? There is not, Your Honor. Okay. Um, we are running wildly ahead of schedule. So if there is a need from either advocate or any juror to take a three to five minute break to collect thoughts or prepare at all, uh, I will entertain and grant that. Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed with the government's closing argument. Yes, Your Honor. First, may I request time be reserved for rebuttal? You can, and I'll, I'll rely on your timekeeper or the bailiff to tell us um, prior to your rebuttal how much time you have left. Yes, um, sir. The, uh, I forgot one thing. Hang on. I, I have a script I'm supposed to follow that I minimize to look at it and get it. Um, the one thing I would ask is that everyone change back to speaker view so that um, we only see the person that's talking. And that button is in the upper right hand corner. And I appreciate the reminder. May it please the court, nothing mattered more to Kara Bassett, the elephants, nothing. Defendant was the elephant queen. She loved and cared for these elephants and she would stop at nothing to protect them. Nothing is more important to me than these animals, nothing. <laughs> Members of the jury, you've just heard Kara Bassett's own words. Nothing is more important to her. Not even her husband of six years, Don Clark. Today, the government holds the burden of proof. We've had to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Kara Bassett killed her husband, Don, with malice of forethought, which means that she meant to kill her husband. We've proven this to you beyond a reasonable doubt because in her own words, nothing mattered more to her than elephants. Miss Fenio has told you that there's no way to know that Don is dead. But members of the jury, that's not exactly true. We know that Don is dead. We know this because there was no activity on his bank account, no activity on his phone records, and no one has seen or heard from him in years. Not only that, but at the defendant's own request, the state of Florida declared him legally dead as soon as they could. Because in the words of the defendant herself, he's gone. 
How does the defendant know this? Because she's the one who made him disappear. Members of the jury, all of the evidence points to Kara Bassett. You've heard her tell you that nothing is more important to her than those elephants. Which is why on May 1st, 2017, when Don Clark created a power of attorney, it was Kara Bassett who requested a disappearance clause. It was Kara Bassett who took full advantage of this clause, transforming the park to a sanctuary just one month after he disappeared. Kara Bassett who did this because nothing mattered more to her than the elephants. It was Kara Bassett who had access to a deadly syringe of carfentanil. Members of the jury, the defendant admitted during interrogation that she had access to this carfentanil. You've heard Agent Brandon testify that this is a highly lethal substance. On August 1st, Miss Bassett was the last one to check out a syringe. Mysteriously, another one disappeared. Miss Fenyo's right, we never found the syringe. The evidence doesn't lie. August 18th, 2017, Kara Bassett drove Don Clark's van to the Big Gum Swamp. We know she did this because the algae on her boots is very rare. The specific combination of algae matched the Big Gum Swamp, matched Don's van, matched Kara's boots. It shows you that she was at the scene of the crime. Members of the jury, they've tried to tell you that Don Clark's in Costa Rica, but Miss Young has told you that for a full week, she watched the house. No one came in, no one came out. Furthermore, Mandy Tuminelli's statement reads, Don Clark disappeared before he could purchase additional property. Why did he disappear? Because nothing mattered more to Kara Bassett than the elephants. Look at all of the evidence. And all of the evidence points to one person, Kara Bassett. For a full week after he disappeared, she made no attempt to contact her loving husband. She made no attempt to text her loving husband, which shows you members of the jury that she knew where he was. He was gone because to Kara Bassett, nothing mattered more to her than the elephants. So I stand before you today, and I ask you to return a verdict that fits with the defendant's own words. A verdict reflects justice. A verdict of guilty. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the defendant. Yes, Your Honor. He had a plan and she wasn't part of it. At 6 p.m. on August 18th, Mr. Clark received a text message from a Costa Rican phone number. It said, call me immediately. He saw that text, his face turned white. He ran away, gave that phone number a call and 52 Minutes passed. 52 minutes of talking, of planning, of finalizing. Five hours later, Mr. Clark was gone. Off to a new life in Costa Rica. Because on August 18th, Mr. Clark had a plan. And Miss Bassett wasn't part of it. Now, today you learned that while Mr. Clark might not have been expecting that phone call that night, he knew it would come eventually. He had been preparing for some time. You learned today that Mr. Clark had planned to buy property in Costa Rica. He had planned to transfer money into Costa Rican bank accounts. He planned to use off the books cash to do it, and he planned to keep the entire thing from his wife. His disappearance depended on secrecy. And on August 18th, he pulled it off. Now, 
uh, just a few minutes ago in their closing arguments, uh, opposing counsel told you uh, that Don Clark is dead and that they know Don Clark is dead because there was no activity on his bank accounts after August 8th. Members of the jury, uh, today you learn again and again that Mr. Clark had off the books cash. Cash he was already planning to use to fund his departure to Costa Rica, members of the jury. It makes sense that he used that cash, that cash that wouldn't show up on his banking records or his financial records to go to Costa Rica. Members of the jury, uh, that's not all. Uh, today you learn uh, that Mr. Cl Mr. Branham knew all about Mr. Clark's connection to Costa Rica. He knew all about Mr. Clark's plans to buy property in Costa Rica and transfer money to Costa Rica. But not once did Agent Branham tell you that he looked into those plans. Not once did Agent Branham tell you he himself went to Costa Rica to investigate those plans. And members of the jury, while Agent Branham didn't go to Costa Rica to investigate, Miss Young did. And when she went to Mr. Clark's vacation home in Costa Rica, she saw his clothes in the closet. She saw no dust on the counters. She saw a fan that was on fan that was on a full year after Mr. Clark had disappeared. Members of the jury, that's evidence that Mr. Clark was alive, that Mr. Clark went to Costa Rica to start a new life. Now, today, opposing counsel has charged Ms. Bassett with the murder of Don Clark. And they had the burden of proving that to you today uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, that's a problem for the prosecution. Let's talk about what? Uh, starting with the syringe of carfentanil that they claim is a murder weapon. Now, members of the jury, the only fact they have to back up that claim is that my client had access to that syringe. But so did 11 other employees, and so did the FBI. And in fact, Ms. Young told you today she saw FBI agents mishandling those, those syringes, touching them without gloves. Uh, what if one of the FBI agents simply misplaced that syringe? Or what if one of the other 11 employees just used that syringe and forgot to log it? Members of the jury, the short answer is, is that we don't know. We don't know whose fingerprints were on that syringe. We don't know what forensic evidence was on that syringe. But what we do know is there's no evidence to show that that syringe is a murderer. So moving to the next piece of evidence that opposing counsel relied on the GPS evidence. Now, today it's not in dispute that Mr. Clark's van was driven to Big Gum Swamp on August 18th. What is in dispute is who drove it there. And while opposing counsel just told you that my client drove the van to the swamp to dispose of her husband's body, Agent Branham himself told you on that witness stand today that when they searched that swamp, they didn't find Mr. Clark's body. And they also it didn't find his keys, or his phone, or his wallet, all things he would have taken with him if he went to Costa Rica. And lastly, the algae found on my client's hands. Now, opposing counsel just told you this algae had tied my client to the crime, that it came from Big Gums. But members of the jury, we don't know that. Could it have come from the dirt at the elephant park? We don't know. Uh, could it have come from the watering holes at the Elephant Park? We don't know. And the reason we don't know is that the FBI didn't take a single sample of algae from anywhere within the Elephant Park. From anywhere where my client lived, where my client worked, where my client spent every single day of her life. Now, members of the jury, I know that I just asked you a lot of questions but I wanna ask you three more. At the same three I asked in my opening statements, the same three I asked Agent Branham today. Did the FBI recover Mr. Clark's body? No. Did the FBI recover a murder weapon? No. And did anyone see my client driving that van on August 18th? No. No, no, no. And members of the jury, what opposing counsel is asking you to do is find a woman guilty with no body, with no murder weapon, with no visual proof.
proof with no evidence to meet their burden. Today, opposing counsel told you the evidence doesn't lie. And it doesn't. The evidence shows that Ms. Bassett didn't kill her husband. It shows that he abandoned her for a new life in Costa Rica. He had a plan. She wasn't part of it. Find Ms. Bassett not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Can we get a time check, please? Uh, Your Honor, while I'm not the second chair, my second chair communicated that I have two minutes and seven seconds left for a rebuttal. Any objection by the defendant for that? No, Your Honor. Let's proceed. Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. Members of the jury, nothing mattered more to Kara Bassett was Elvis, especially not her husband. Ms. Fenio just told you that Don Clark had a plan, but the only plan you've seen evidence here today is that of the defendant herself. Let's take a moment to talk about Don's properties in Costa Rica. In Mandy Tuminelli's own statement, she says that Don disappeared before they could work out the details. He didn't have a plan. He made a suggestion. But Ms. Bassett executed her plan on August 18th, 2017, because nothing was more important to her than these elephants. The government's burden is that of beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is one that's not imaginary, it's not speculative, and it's not vague. And the only doubts Ms. Fenio's brought to you today are imaginary, are vague, and are speculative. Members of the jury, and Ms. Young's own words, no one went in or out of Don Clark's house for a week. There's no food in the house, no toiletries, all the lights were off. But it was Miss Bassett who needed him dead. It was Miss Bassett who cared about the elephants. It was the defendant who invoked power of attorney and made her dreams come true. She was the elephant queen and nothing mattered more to her than those elephants. All of the evidence points to the defendant. The boots, the power of attorney, the syringe that she had access to, it all points to her. Find Miss Bassett guilty of murder. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Um, at this point, I will ask the people judging this round to submit ballots. 